and welcome back. Hope you managed to recharge during the break. And now, our next session will be Rethinking Communication Theory for Wireless Network Systems. Now, wireless network systems, or wireless networks rather, are evolving to cater to emerging cyber-physical and mission-critical interactive systems, such as swarm robotics, self-driving cars, and smart Internet of Things. Now, this talk describes some of the shifts in thinking that may be needed to develop a post-Shannon theory, and it will also highlight the potential as well as the challenges of goal-oriented communication which aims at redefining timing, importance, and effectiveness in future networked intelligent systems. To help bring us through all of this is the Professor and Chair PI on Advanced Wireless Systems at the Communication Systems Department, Eurocom. He has received several career and best paper awards, including an ERC Consolidator Grant in 2020, the IEEE Communication Society CTTC Early Achievement Award in 2016, and the Outstanding EMEA or EMEA Young Researcher Award in 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Marios Contouris. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for for the introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation to this very stimulating event. Let me share my screen uh, to start the talk. Okay. C can you see my screen? Is everything fine? Yes, we can see it very clearly. Okay. Thank you very much. So today we're going to talk uh, about how uh, new systems, 6G or even any future generation, uh, could impact the way we design uh, things and how to redefine uh, our research tools and also our practice. So before starting, the first question, and I think many other uh, speakers have addressed that, is what 6G will be, what's going to be actually. And whenever we want to design a new generation, the first question would say, okay, it's going to be just a faster new generation. So like 6G could be a faster 5G. But then we always have the question, uh, should we go for a clean slate approach? Maybe we should do something radical. Any new generation tries to do something completely new than the other ones. But then comes the question, okay, which are the key technologies? Which are the enablers? for that? Do we have the right theory, the right techniques, the right algorithms to do that? And also, these days, uh, there are many people saying that, okay, uh, 6G is, is going to be probably uh, something which have a lot of machine learning and AI inside. So maybe we should not care much about some physical design or some communication theory, because you know we're going to let some part to the uh, data-driven approaches. And there have been always a bunch of discussions and, and, and papers saying, okay, is physical layer dead? Do we have to do something wireless? Uh, maybe some people say, okay, we're close to the fundamental limits. So there's nothing new to be done here. Maybe wireless theory will bring something just a small epsilon to the whole picture. So maybe we should focus more on the applications or uh, to some uh, system integration. Uh, and this is what we're trying to, to, to see in this talk. Are we really in that uh, situation? So the first thing is like, if somebody asked me to paint uh, how uh, future wireless communication will be or how 6 is going to be, I think with a bit of exaggeration, uh, the fixed picture that comes to mind is like the situation is something like this. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, sharing the vision and there are different technologies coming into play, but we don't have a a clear answer what 6G is going to be. But of course, the situation is not that hopeless. So we try to design things the way we want. And then uh, there is some kind of emerging consensus of what 6G uh, we want to be. So 5G uh, has, has this kind of uh, triangle uh, and having this uh, 
requirements, the KPIs, the key, key performance indicators for not only for mobile broadband, the EMBB, but also brought uh, some new exciting things about ultra uh, reliability and low latency. And start thinking that, okay, broadband and uh, high rate and high spectral efficiency is not the only way, thing that we have to care. There is a lot of connectivity issues. There's a lot of uh, um, sensor enable uh, uh, mach uh, sensor enable machines that, they, that will come and will provide connectivity for and this is what we want to care now 6g is going to probably take some of these kpis and bring it in like with a factor of 10 100 and go to some extreme requirements but this also is going to have a mixture uh, and some kind of contour of these kind of things so it's going to be more like a pyramid or a more complicated form where we want sometimes to have uh, low latency, ultra high reliability, but also not for short packets, but also for uh, for for long packets, for high throughput applications like the virtual reality things. We're going to have like peak rates of one terabps. This is what we're dreaming of, and the challenges are uh, way uh, bigger than what we have. Now, of course, as I said, things are not that desperate. We have a consensus view. Uh, the community research one and also the practitioners are uh, contributing to that. And 6G, we, more or less, we know that it's going to be something that will provide virtual unlimited connectivity. So now connectivity will never be an issue. Everybody is expecting to have this and having almost like zero failure. And everything is brought to the extreme, like ultra low latency, ultra high precision, very high uh, peak rate like terabps. And of course, we're going to talk about multi-service and multi-tenant networks. And there is also a consensus in the timeline. We have also the standardization activities with 3GPP. So things are, let's say, on track. And there have been a bunch of proposals about the technology uh, enablers for that. And everything is basically going beyond. Like we're going to go beyond the MIMO and the massive MIMO and go with the large intelligence surfaces or reflecting uh, uh, surfaces and me meta surfaces. Probably we're going to challenge the notion of cell and go for cell-free architectures. And again, we have the, the typical debate of should we uh, design a new waveform and go beyond OFDM? going to higher frequencies. These are things that, of course, uh, expectedly come into the pictures. Of course, now, if we think it from an engineering point of view, what uh, the future challenge is going to be is going to be the hardware. Now we're start touching the limitations uh, and the challenges that we're going to have from the hardware perspective, whether this is the ADC, the you know, digital converter, and the electronics that may have some fundamental limitations. So maybe we we do not have limitations in terms of, let's say, information and communication theory in certain uh, parts, but we might have limitations from the hardware we're going to uh, provide uh, to, to do that. And of course, there's always a big question mark because many generations try, for example, to challenge OFDM, but uh, maybe we're not ready to leave our uh, amazing engineering and designs we have done so far and have been successful. Uh, just to get uh, an extra gain of something that we were not secure that is going to work in practice. So many of these uh, things has also have a bit of skepticism. For example, people uh, working on uh, extreme high frequencies, uh, we start realizing, for example, the challenges that we have. And then, for example, millimeter wave uh, has been one of the key, um, uh, key new technologies for 5G and probably 5G+. Plus. But uh, in terms of implementation, we, we, we see also the challenges. Uh, what we also know, uh, or let's say we agree uh, from different perspectives, is that there's a bunch of new services, applications, and use cases that we would like to see, and that we would like that wireless networks uh, providing the, uh, the platform and the foundation for them. Uh, whether this is like kind of multi-sensoring, virtual reality, uh, some kind of sensing and 3D uh, imaging, tactile internet, consumer robotics, all these things are uh, we're dreaming of. And we want the wireless to do that, to enable that. What we also uh, facing and um, seeing is that now wireless and 6G wireless is not alone. 
is coming together and there's an intersection with uh, the analytics and the machine learning. Uh, we, should, we should face that as well. And we have also the IoT, the Internet of Things, and all these uh, billions of start getting smart devices that they are, will uh, communicate the one with, the, uh, with each other in an autonomous way sometimes. And there is a big intersection there. Now, trying to define a bit um, or in a simplistic way what 6G could be and even you know uh, future generations is like, we started by voice uh, for 2G, then 4G brought the mobile internet, and then 5G for, let's say, uh, uh, some people is just like the wireless internet for things. Now, what 6G will be? Is the wireless for what? For, for, for whom we design this? And for that, we have to look on the emerging uh, ecosystem that we have, the wireless ecosystem, and we see a kind of emerging cyber physical emission critical interactive systems. Uh, this could be, for example, take for example, self-driving cars, smart Internet of Things in the industry 4.0, uh, Schwarm Robotics. We have a bunch of machines uh, that we want to communicate, and sometimes in an autonomous way. And this kind of application calls for reliable real-time communication, autonomous interactions, and some kind of automated decision making on a timely manner. There will be a lot of uh, multi-source fusion uh, and multimodal information from deep sense sensors. There will be a lot of uh, computations that they are moving closer to the device. There's an emerging ecosystem here. And also thinking that for, let's say, 2G, 3G and communication they have uh, were human center, we knew more or less the fundamental limits. We knew, for example, our limitation to uh, to watch a video or an image or make a decision because we're human beings and we have our own limitations. But then what about the machines that they cooperate in a, a very kind of sub-millisecond uh, manner? Do we know the fundamental limits? So there's an emerging uh, area of wireless network system. So it's going to be a billion, a myriad of uh, interconnected devices but these devices will start having a lot of advanced capabilities in terms of sensing, computation, processing, even machine learning. They could uh, make their own decisions based on data-driven approaches. So for me, let's say, and for some other people, 6G will be the wireless for the intelligent machines, all these uh, interconnected machines, which bring a lot of uh, pressing demands. For example, uh, think of said driving cars, collecting information from uh, radar, uh, a video, or LIDAR, and these kind of things. And they have to process all that at a very high speed. They have also to exchange information with other cars, for example, to do a collision avoidance or to detect a pedestrian. And all these cars will communicate in a shared medium. So uh, the amount of information that we should exchange uh, process and also uh, the concessions that the car should have for a certain maneuver should be done in a very, very timely manner, especially if the application is uh, critical, for example, not crossing a pedestrian. Or let's say take this picture from uh, RoboCap where uh, robots are trying to play uh, football together and they exchange information and they have to coordinate and uh, make a, a collaborative decision. These are environments that are very challenging for uh, communication. And then the question we want to address is that, do we know how to do it? Are we uh, in the position to have the right theory, the right tools, and the right algorithms to do that? And of course, in an efficient and practical way. To answer this question, I will go back to the fundamentals. I will go where all these uh, wireless revolutions started. And this is um, coming back from uh, to, to Claude Shannon, who started actually the whole field, uh, where uh, the key was that information uh, for him, it was basically related to uh, uncertainty and surprise. And it was measured by the uncertainty that I have in a certain, when I receive a certain message. So I gain information when I observe something unexpected. And that was the first uh, link uh, with, uh, from, a, from, a, from, let's say, communication point of view, uh, between uh, information and entropy. And we have these two famous theorems of Shannon, 
uh, when I want to compress a source, an information source, uh, I know my fundamental limits. And when I want to communicate data, again, I know uh, the channel capacity and the rate up to which I could, uh, I could send for error-free transmission. That was uh, the starting of information theory and then communication theory. And basically, this is the theory behind or our favorite today's application. And uh, it's undebatably a success story. All this kind of uh, applications today and the wireless is based on this fundamental theory to the point that some people are trying to apply it in many uh, fields uh, and brought this kind of uh, uh, bandwagon effect. So let's go now uh, what this uh, communication paradigm has been. Uh, going back to uh, the famous paper that started this back in 1948, we have three key things. The first one is that the fundamental problem that we, we are dealing with is basically I have some information on one point and I want to reproduce it exactly or approximately at the other side. And what occurs is to reliably transfer this information and ideally in, 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 in it entirely. Now, the second thing is that, okay, this information should represent something. So there is, there is a message that has a meaning and has some kind of uh, probably value, but for us, this is not important, let's say. Okay, that was the kind of uh, master stroke that simplified the problem in a meaningful way and brought all this successful design. And the third thing is something that we normally uh, forget or take it for granted is that the encoder and the decoder are centrally designed. So they have some common background as well. They have some common uh, co uh, code book, for example, the message is coming from the same code book. So they have some kind of context and background in common to be able to communicate. It's not a completely agnostic uh, autonomous operation. And of course, this creates some kind of uh, lore that this is the theory of information quantity and not of content. So it's like kind of information content agnostic. And because that was a the success there, back there, the problem was the noise rather than what the signal carries. And that was has been uh, suitable for classical human-centric communication, and that has been successful and debated. Now, of course, back then already, uh, in addition to this model, it has been identified that, okay, we don't just see random sequences of beats, or we could not always ignore what these messages are bringing to the other side. There is a semantic problem, which is how precisely the symbols that I'm sending uh, convey a certain meaning. And there's also the effectiveness problem. So it's like, I'm sending some information to the other side for some reason, how effectively uh, this changes the behavior of the destination. This is what some people will call it, like kind of from information. And that was have been already from, uh, let's say the fifties there, okay? But now, we start facing the limitation, we start facing uh, to need to design systems that they need this kind of radical change from, uh, let's say, a classical Shannon theory to something that we will call post-Shannon communication theory. And this involves a departure, a radical departure for just a quantitative, uh, purely and based on entropy approach to something that takes into account the context, the information content, and also some qualitative kind of uh, elements. So the vision here is I need a theory, I need a new theory to enable the generation and the timely provision of information which is concisely represented. So I transmit only what is needed on the other side for a specific goal. And then it's effective. It managed to solve my problem and my application to, in, in, in the best manner. And then also has to be arrived to the right point of processing or computation. And the key to do that is something that in uh, our community now is emerging and we call it uh, semantics uh, or semantics of information. This has become a commonplace here. And, but semantics has been associated with other things. Normally like semantic web, we, semantics is the meaning of the messages. But here semantics is not the meaning of the messages. We use this term with its uh, etymological significance, which is uh, important. Well, this comes from uh, ancient Greek, it's like important, that's, that's semantics. So semantics here is not the meaning, although it's not excluded, but is related to the significance 
to the importance and the usefulness of the message that's transmitted to the other side with respect to a certain communication goal. Why is that? Because the communication paradigm is also something where we're in a situation where communication is not an end in itself, but the means to achieve a specific goal. So I send my information. So let's say robots exchange information to do something, to do some kind of navigation or self-driving cars are exchanging information, not, not as, 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 an, as an end, but because they want, for example, to do collision avoidance or because they want to, to arrive to certain cooperative uh, behavior. So there is a goal that I have to achieve. And so in this case, uh, I cannot just treat packets as uh, something which I don't care what they carry and when they have to be delivered and to which node. This packet has a certain content and this content has certain utility and value. So then I have to take this into account, subject to the goal, of course. And this also changed uh, the thing from uh, something that I transmit. Uh, so what, what, in, the, in the traditional way, uh, we don't care where the traffic is coming from. But here we need also to uh, start from where the, the traffic or the information is generated. So the big goal here that we're trying to do, and this is what uh, a new communication theory, post-channel communication theory should do, is this kind of goal-oriented unification of the whole communication process, starting from the information generation, its transmission, and its utilization. Okay. So in, in Shannon's communication model, back in uh, in the 50s basically and this is uh, this, this is the typical picture uh, communication has been uh, just a pipe which we just want to make it bigger and bigger and somebody is giving me uh, some exogenous traffic i don't know from where it comes just need to represent it uh, to to send it to the other side and then my typical metrics is like uh, maximize the throughput minimize the delay or have a very good uh, bit error rate and normally what I'm doing is a kind of non-causal signal deconstruction. So the goal-oriented model comes and change and challenge or a bit augment this communication model and start already from the generation of the traffic. Now I can generate traffic uh, in a way of uh, an active sampling. So I go and generate the traffic when it's needed to serve my goal based on what the source and, or the process represent. I send only the information that is useful to achieve my goal or uh, the requirements of my application. And this involves starting from uh, filtering, uh, pre-processing to also uh, care about when to transmit what. And now the metric that I want to optimize is basically to achieve my goal. And I want to maximize the semantic value of the effectiveness of the information I'm sending on the other side. And this problem Comes challenging when I have to do real time reconstruction. So, here we're not in the case where I have like, I can allow long sequences. Here I might start to have to decode or start reconstructing the source in a real time manner, uh, which is a completely different problem. So, the big question that comes into play is that what is semantics of information? Because there are many people talking about this and uh, of course, we, we, we say it's, it's, it's the effectiveness, it's the significance or the usefulness of the information, but this is a high level perception. So we need to define it. And that's one of the key challenges here. So we define the semantic information to uh, three levels. The first one is at the level of the data source and the uh, process that we observe. And this is what I will call the microscopic level. And this is related the semantics is related to the relative importance of the different outcomes of the events or the observation of the same probability. Now, I'll go, if I go one step further, I have the mesoscopic level, which is in the level of link uh, communication, communication links. And this is related to the quantity, but also qualitative information attributes, which I will uh, talk about uh, a bit later. And there is a bigger picture, uh, the macroscopic level, which is, has to do with the, some kind of system-wide information flow. And then it has to do with this kind of system state and timing dilation, which I will talk uh, a bit later. So in the macroscopic le level, as I said, it has to do with the relative important, of, importance of an observation. So for example, uh, if you have two highly improbable events 
Uh, so they arrive with probability very, very low, which means that the information I will get from these are is, is high. If we neglect the context or the importance that each observer will give, from an entropic point of view, they are the same. If, for example, they have the same probability to happen, uh, then they're the same. But from an observer's point of view for a specific goal, they might have a different kind of value. Let's take the example, for example, that uh, it's going to have a heavy rain or uh, a kind of hurricane uh, in Sahara Desert or next to your place. Let's say these two events are uh, highly improbable. Now, the value of learning this from the observer point of view could be different because although they bring the same amount of information from an entropy point of view, for the Sahara Desert, maybe you say, okay, it's good to know, but for, if it's next to my place, probably you're going to run your place and then try to protect uh, something or your car or something. So there is a different value depending on who receives that information and for which goal. And in the simplest form, you, this can be expressed with some kind of weighted information measure, taking into account the semantics in this kind of space-time dependent functions that could skew, let's say, the... Uh, the amount of information a certain event carries. And there's a very intriguing connections with uh, Rennie entropy and uh, Rennie order. And it has very nice connections with uh, the compressibility, the complexity of a signal and so on. I will not go into the details. Um, I will pass to the mesoscopic level, which has to do with uh, taking into account different attributes information. And information has two kinds of attributes. The first one is the inherent ones, the innate ones. And this could be uh, freshness, precision, accuracy, for example. And it has also contextual ones that depends on the use of information that I'm doing in a specific uh, uh, time. And this has to do with uh, the completeness of information, if I have to take a decision, the timeless. When, when a certain information arrives at the destination, it did arrive uh, at the right time, it arrived late, and it's too late. It's arrived very early, and then this information is becoming outdated. All these things uh, play a role here, and this is key for, the, for defining the semantics of information. So let's say an operational definition of the semantics of information could be that it's a function of this qualitative innate, which is objective, and contextual, which has some kind of subjectivity, attributes of information. And of course, there is a very interesting uh, duality in terms of the value of information. For example, um, we can have uh, a measurement that have a certain resolution, and this resolution will always be there. And for example, we represent uh, with an amount of accuracy uh, the reality. But this precision could be very useful for a simple application. For example, if I measure the temperature in the room, and just need to know that is, I don't know, uh, between uh, uh, 25 and 27 uh, Celsius degree. But this measurement can be completely useless if what I, I care is to find, uh, to, 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 to measure the temperature in a nuclear plant. Uh, so information could have also its own value per se, but is also the value change depending on the context. And a definition could be that the semantic information is just this um, nonlinear, uh, multidimensional, let's say, function of these attributes. Let's take a simple example to understand a bit better uh, what we're talking about here. So, for example, I can have uh, two, um, let's say, innate attributes. The one is the freshness of information, which some people uh, uh, would be familiar as the age of information, which is the amount of time that has passed uh, from when I receive uh, a certain uh, sample at time t and when the sample has been generated, not when it has been sent, but when it has been generated. For example, uh, here is not delay that plays into role because maybe uh, it's not only the, the transmission delay here, but it's also when this information has been generated. Think, for example, about news. Uh, even if you receive very fast uh, news that they are from yesterday, uh, they are not that fresh as news that they arrive maybe with uh, more, a bit more delayed from, from the physical layer, but they have been uh, just sample uh, one second or two seconds before. They represent the reality more accurately. So 
this is uh, in a way the, the freshness of information. Of course, there's a whole field behind and uh, a lot of work on this. And I have a certain distortion between the signals. I have a signal X on one side, I reproduce it on the other side, and I have this kind of uh, distortion. And I take a function psi here, which is just the product. So I assume that my metric here is a product between uh, the freshness of information and uh, the distortion. And of course, I have a contextual attribute, which is the timeliness, which can have, for example, this kind of uh, representation. So I'm having the same value if I receive uh, the information with this interval, but then if I exceed a certain, uh, a certain time, then it has exponentially decreasing uh, value for me. So I should receive it up to here and then it's exponentially decreasing and basically up to a certain uh, point it becomes uh, useless. Now I'm coming to the third level, which is this uh, microscopic one. And this is one of the most interesting ones and uh, let's say a novel. Now take here an example where, what is the fundamental problem here? The fundamental problem here is I have information generated at a certain uh, time t in certain point in space, uh, let's say A1 with this kind of coordinates. And I want to send and reproduce this information, I want to transfer this information to another point, A2, where it has different coordinate in space and a different time. And I have an observer, thinking of an observer, a robot, like taking measurements of the real world and the physical world. And I have the virtual world. I have to do some kind of remote uh, monitoring at, the, uh, at, the, at A2. So this is the observer. And it gets uh, a, a reconstruction of the signal. So taking the fundamental limbs that I have to compress this information and the duration that I have, what we're trying to do basically is to minimize this kind of system level distortion that I will have between the two states, between the physical world state and the virtual state. And I have to basically synchronize these two images, let's say, these two uh, systems. And I have to uh, minimize the, the time mismatch and the asynchronicity that I will have. So this brings the analogy with the twin paradox from uh, relativity, when basically times evolves in a, in, in, in a different way in the two sides. And I'm, I have this kind of correction that I have to do for the dilation. And of course, I have to do it also for the evolution and the, of the state between the two ends. So this brings some kind of nice analogies with uh, relativity. And of course, it's not uh, relativity theory, but it has to uh, capitalize on the analogies that they have, redefining time, synchronicity, and simultaneously um, simultaneity in communication systems. And I can explore the framework that I have in uh, mathematical physics and all this Minkowski space to be able to uh, synchronize uh, and have, let's say, um, two pictures uh, very uh, representative, the one to to the other. Of course, this has a lot of uh, theory behind that. Now, we wanted to go this kind of goal-oriented communication. Let's try to go a bit deeper and say, OK, um, how does the model look like? And how does this change from the current uh, approach? The model changes because it starts already with the information generation. So I have a certain process. It could be continuous time or, or discrete time, and it can be a general. And I take samples of this process when is needed or when I have to, when, when there is change in the, sta in the status or in the process. And this is what triggers a certain sample, but this has to be done jointly with whether I should be able to send, uh, to communicate the sample and reconstruct it given certain constraints that I have from the application. Um, and of course I will have from the reconstruction, I have a certain kind of metric uh, and normally how this can be some kind of real time uh, reconstruction error. I have certain distortion and this changed the whole design. And the key here, and this approach is not separable. The way I generate, the way I sample, the way I, I transmit the information, the way I construct it, given certain constraints for, for achieving my goal, uh, it has to be done jointly. Uh, this is not the typical separability here that uh, we normally use, at least for point to point links, that uh, simplifies the problem. 
And it changed the way I have to do encoding. It changed the way I do reconstruction. It changed the way I generate my traffic. Of course, this is a simple problem. The problem is a bit more tricky when I have uh, multiple sources, uh, thinking like multiple sensors, seeing probably uh, the same event. So I have here um, some kind of the same physical phenomenon seen from different sensors, from different angles. Think, for example, camera spotting at the same, uh, uh, same area, but seeing different kind of views. And this has to be, uh, it's, it has some correlation. I could exploit the sparsity here when I have to do the joint reconstruction or fusion of this information. And thinking this, when it has to be sent over a shared medium, over a shared communication channel, uh, things scale uh, in a way that I have to change the way I solve the problem and in a meaningful way. And of course, the bigger picture as well is that this uh, there's a multiple multi-point uh, communication here when I have a shared multiple access. And the idea is to take into account uh, the goal-oriented design, but also take uh, into account the semantic uh, properties of the source and the application requirements to do my, uh, my work. There's a lot of operation that have to be uh, enabled here, starting from filtering and censoring what is the, uh, the useful information for my goal. And then I have to do sometimes some kind of pre-processing, exploiting the sparsity, do some kind of feature presentation, feature extraction, and send the only the meaningful information to the other side. I could do some kind of pre-processing. Then, of course, when I have to reproduce, I will have to reproduce it probably uh, not, not exactly accurate, but according to the accuracy that my application imposed to me. So this will give me, will open uh, some kind of uh, fast partial and approximate uh, representation. And of course, there has to be a kind of uh, network orchestration here so that uh, we, we share the medium in a most efficient way. Uh, let's go to something uh, that comes naturally here. Uh, and this comes from rate distortion theory, where basically I have a certain, uh, certain source that I have to find the minimum rate I could communicate that source to the other side to a noisy over a noisy channel so that I will get it with certain distortion. This is a well-studied problem, uh, rate distortion theory, and this is basically where I have, sorry, well, this is where I formulate this problem, the minimum mutual information subject to a certain um, average distortion constraint, and I get this kind of curves. Now, if you take this example, uh, you'll see above uh, something that has uh, good quality, let's say, uh, as compared to uh, down. But then if you check it above, actually, according to my metrics, I will have a high distortion. But then uh, the perceptual quality it will have been better if I want, for example, to detect that there's a bit in here as compared to here. And below, I have low distortion, but I have a bad perceptual quality. And this is an example coming from a paper from 2018, which shows that something that I measure based on distortion or the signal to noise ratio does not necessarily uh, translate naturally to the quality as a user that I will see to, achieve, to, to do a certain goal. For example, detect the pedestrian here, uh, or, or the, uh, something like a sign or a or or, or, or bicycle. And this brings the notion of the semantic quality indicator that has to be incorporated into this ray distortion uh, theory. Uh, and of course, this becomes challenging when I have to do with real-time uh, constraints, when I go beyond the typical long sequences that our usual theory has. So here, if I, if I put the real-time constraints, things change completely. And what I care is not only to, to minimize the distortion between a certain sequence or certain image has been sent at a given time, but I want also to minimize uh, the distortion in a way, the distance uh, between uh, the statistics of the source. And this can be captured with a certain uh, function. And this changes the completely the, uh, it compl change completely the uh, the rate distortion perception region, and it goes. Uh, I need more rate, high rate, to get a certain perceptual quality, a certain semantic perceptual quality. But then, 
do we have uh, the schemes to achieve that? Is this achievable? Uh, do, can we communicate in this kind of rate? Of course, how I will take uh, the semantic quality indicator? A very simple idea it could be a, a certain divergence between the probability distributions and then what the, was the Stein distance, for example, is one of, a, of a good ideas here. There's a lot of uh, theory coming here. And this is a very uh, interesting framework because it brings the bigger picture. And this, I think, is the, is, is, is the last uh, kind of new element I will bring. What is the bigger picture here, actually, in the semantics? I start with a very complex idea. Uh, I have something, uh, a source, that now is not just uh, a zero, one, a binary source that represents certain thing, but you have a certain uh, semantically complex content that normally lies in a very high dimensional distribution. So I need to communicate a source uh, that belongs to a certain high dimension distribution. Now, I don't know how to do that normally. This is not something that I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm used to do that. Normally, I will have to do some kind of uh, projection in a different information manifold, and I have a low dimension distribution, something that I know how to transmit. For example, we know how to transmit Gaussian sources in communication, then I'm probably I will have to bring the problem down to what I, I need so that I use some of my favorite tools. And the key here is that the encoding and the sensing and the preprocessing they are all part of the same uh, and bigger picture of the encoder that we have in Shannon theory. This will pass from a certain channel, so we'll get some kind of noisy distribution. And then I will have to decode, fuse if it's like kind of multi-source information, reconstruct my source, but there is an intriguing connection here with generative models because at the end, what I will have to do is I will have to reproduce this uh, semantic content, this complex data. And so for that, I will need to have a generative model uh, for the distribution, uh, which is normally high dimensional. I might not even know it, or even I might not be able to calculate the mutual information to do uh, an, an efficient way of information transmission. and. The bigger picture is basically I have to represent to send the complex content or idea from one side to the other, and this change the whole way that I have to do communication. Either I will have to go for communication of high dimensional multimodal information sources. Is this the right way to just explore the, the complexity of my problem, or should I uh, do the connection between generative models and optimal transport theory here, so then I can be able to reproduce with high fidelity uh, the semantic uh, data that I want to transmit on the other side for a specific goal. Of course, fidelity and timing here would depend on the context. And there is a, a lot of exciting uh, trade-offs here uh, since sensing, pre-processing, coding, all these things come inside of the transmitter side and then the, the construction, the fusion comes on the, on the receiver side and this goes uh, integrated and we cannot only separate it. I'll do communication and somebody else will do uh, the computation. And imagine that this is a point-to-point -point link. Imagine this being on a shared medium and having the distributed part of this. So does this work? Uh, we try these kind of ideas on a simple framework and this has been on uh, real-time tracking. And uh, we have a very simple scenario when I have a robot that monitors a two-state discrete Markov source and is sending sending sample to the other side to, to do some kind of actuation. And then basically what I'm doing, I'm doing a real-time tracking of, of, of a simple source. And I have two metrics. The one is the real-time reconstruction uh, error, which is whenever I have state, let's say, zero here, and I have state one erroneously on the other side, so I would reproduce something uh, which is not correct, then I declare that I have a real-time reconstruction error, which can be also time average. And I have a certain of penalty or certain cost of the actuation error, because at the end, it's not what I want is not to minimize the distortion between xt and x hat t. Is I have, let's say, robot that hits uh, left or right with a certain hammer. What I care is whether I miss some of these events. And this uh, penalty that we have can, can be also non-commutative. So for example, uh, detecting uh, being in zero when my original source is at one might have a different cost when, on, on the other when the source is at, at, at state one and I'm at state zero. Think for example, traffic light. Sometimes it's 
uh, it's better to break if you detect uh, erroneously that the traffic light is red but is green, you will embed traffic, but nobody's life is going to be in danger. But if you take a red traffic light for green and you accelerate, uh, probably this might have an accident. So you see that the, the, the penalty or the cost that they have in the actuation error is not always commutative. And then we uh, we find uh, we apply for uh, different goal-oriented sampling communication techniques, the usual uniform and based on information freshness, the age, and two emerging ones, the change aware when I generate a sample at the transmitter, whenever I detect a change in, in the state of the source and go one step further and including also the receiver side, then I generate a sample whenever uh, the transmitter and receiver have a discrepancy in the states of their signals or the status basically. And uh, this is what I get in terms of real time reconstruction error and cost of actuation. So you see that uh, for certain rapidly uh, varying source and different probability of success, 0509, uh, the semantics of where uh, sampling and communication uh, gets a real time reconstruction, which is, which is very low compared to the traditional approaches and the cost of actuation error uh, is also very low. And all that comes, and this is the key, is that because I send the right information that I need so that I minimize my real-time reconstruction error and the cost of actuation error, and I don't send samples that are, let's say, useless or uninformative. And this is, actually, these curves are uh, obtained for the semantics aware and the change aware by sending less than 5%, sometimes even 1% or even lower of uninformative samples, where in the uniform, for example, I will send samples that probably I could have avoid saying them because it's just like they don't bring anything into the problem and they just use resources, let's say more or less for nothing. So to conclude, I will say that if we want to support all these autonomous real-time connected intelligence system, these wireless network systems, we will need definitely a new communication theory and change or challenge certain of the uh, prevailing communication paradigms that we have. And I presented a certain vision, a certain communication paradigm whose challenge is basically this goal-oriented unification starting from the uh, data generation and processing, the information transmission, and the reconstruction. What we expect to gain from that, uh, basically, we will do a more, uh, we will have a reduction on the significant reduction in the amount of energy that we consume to sample something, to send something, and also the resources we're going to use, the congestion we're going to bring into the network by sending packets that they are not meaningful for the end goal that I want to achieve. And this also will improve the computation efficiency, which all of these are key for the scalability of this kind of autonomous uh, real time system. And of course, it will open uh, many exciting applications. This is the foundation technology for a plethora of socially useful services uh, from uh, swarm robotics, telehealth, environmental monitoring, and so on. Um, this is some kind of a new paradigm. And for that, I would like to uh, also give the credit to, this, to the sponsor. This is also uh, coming from uh, the ERC Consolidator Grant that uh, I have been awarded and uh, I have to acknowledge uh, this, the support. And if you want uh, certain details or uh, exchange ideas on this emerging topic, uh, which is very interesting, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, drop me an email. And with that, I will conclude my talk and I will thank you for your uh, attendance and I'm open to answer questions. Thank you so much, Professor Marius Contouris. And of course, uh, we're going to go straight into uh, some of the uh, Q&As from our audience right now, starting with this question from PG Patil. And the question is, will there be a challenge from a data integrity perspective? If not, how do we validate to demonstrate data integrity? Now, the background of this question is regarding monitoring and communication of fast-changing process parameters. So, uh, Professor, what do you think? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Very, very good questions. And um, 
there's a lot of things here about data integrity. There's also the security aspects here. Um, here, the idea is not to, um, the, the, there's a misconception that we have to ask and uh, um, have to act on uh, getting to know the data uh, of a certain user so that I, um, I'm able to optimize the system. Here, the idea is that the user, which is now probably is a robot, will get some guidelines on what is the application that it has to support and how it needs to um, generate the data and transmit it to the other side. So it's not collecting, it's, it's not having a central controller who's gonna collect all this information, filter, so act on the data, filter them, and then do these things, get rid of some redundancy if it's not needed, and then send it on the other side. It's a different approach. It's like the, the node, uh, which could be a robot, it could be a car and so on, becomes uh, the king of, of the process and it has kind of autonomous capabilities to decide on the data. But of course, uh, certain security aspects or data integrity uh, have to be studied. And I didn't talk about security, but this is a very important uh, topic here, uh, definitely. Uh, about the real-time parameter things, yeah, real-time is actually one of the key things that makes uh, things not trivial here. Uh, so that's the thing. We bring the communication theory into new constraints, which is the real time. And I, I don't work anymore in these ergodic long sequences, but uh, it's this kind of, uh, I have to uh, do some kind of remote monitoring, remote estimation, remote tra real time tracking with real time constraints. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Contouris, for answering that question. And uh, we have another question for you. And this time, this question is, is goal-oriented com communication a 6G enabling technology or not? What's your take? So um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I would not call it a 6G per se, uh, in the sense that uh, this brings a, the, these goal-oriented things brings a new communication paradigm that it's a bit, I think, is a change in the philosophy and the way we design systems. That of course some of these idea could penetrate. Uh, or could feed the the design of 6G systems, uh, but it's a little bit bigger than that. So it will probably serve and to this 6G plus, if we can already talk about the future generation beyond 6G. So it's not, um, it's not necessarily something that it will serve 6G per se, although it will inspire the designs. Of course, the faster we go, having a very uh, meaningful theory that, that, that brings insights and useful designs, the faster we'll, 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 we'll go to the 6D design and the standardization process. But it's also have very good interactions with other fields uh, having to do with computer vision, control systems, and other activities rather than just uh, you know, uh, 6D broadband. Thank you so much and we hope that answered that question, our next question is this. The presented communication paradigm has similarities or can be seen as an extension of known concepts such as age of information and joint source channel coding. So how is it different? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a usual kind of criticism or the, the, the first uh, feeling of some people when, when, when they listen to this kind of uh, uh, new, new ideas. And um, age of information has been inspiring into giving certain ideas. So for example, detecting uh, that, for example, throughput the delay, they are not the right metrics all the time, or we have to do some kind of joint sampling of communication. They came from the age of information kind of work and community. So for some people, it's just uh, a small extension of age information could work. But here, this goes, let's say, way bigger. And just age of information is just one dimension out of, let's say, uh, 10. Uh, so although you give the, the insights, it's not just a simple, trivial, nonlinear extension of age of information. There's a lot of other things that come into play. And although it resembles, especially the rate distortion theoretic framework that in joint source channel coding, that is something well studied. Uh, here we have real-time constraints. So uh, these are uh, things that hasn't been studied or we don't have 
need solutions for that in the existing joint short channel coding uh, uh, theory. And, uh, or we don't always have the separability the way I have it, especially when I have to do content, which has to do like image and video and not just uh, a simple source. And of course it builds upon joint short channel coding, joint short channel coding, but we're in a different area and it's actually uh, the problems that we have to tackle are way more challenging and there's a lot of work to do for that. Thank you so much. Now we have another question here. This time it's about uh, technical risk and challenges and it's this. What are the major technical risks and challenges of goal-oriented communication theory? Can you explain? Yeah, actually, as this is a new thing and this is kind of uh, an emerging topic. So there's a plenty of recent challenges from theoretical point of view and uh, practical point of view. But I think the key is first the, the, the theoretical point of view, which is also our, our focus here. I think the number one challenge is to uh, define the fundamentals of the semantics of information, find the right metrics that will allow us to do things. So it's not gonna just drop uh, things inside, drop dimensions, uh, increase the dimensions, have a big optimization problem, joint optimization problem, then it's hopeless to solve it or I don't get any insight uh, and this kind of thing. The idea is to find the same way uh, that uh, classical information theory breaks down to, to entropic measures that was key to unlock uh, the potential of uh, the communication systems is to find the right concise uh, and tractable metrics that will allow us to uh, do things. And also define uh, concretely and in a mathematical way, what is the semantics of information? Because as I said, many this vision is also kind of shared from many people and has been also articulated back in the 50s, actually. Okay, yeah, uh, I want to do goal-oriented and take into account the importance, the relevance, the priority, and these kind of things. There's different flavors here, even in the working community. But what this concretely means and how do I solve problems uh, in a formal way, in a mathematical way, and in a theoretical way based on that? Great. We've got more questions coming in from our audience right now. This next one is from uh, Diana R. And the question is, how do you structure the project based on semantic communication? How do you do that? Um, um, can, can you specify a bit more of the question? When you mean the structure of the, the project, you mean the uh, how the semantics will play a role here in, in the communication or uh, we refer to the project of like the ERC or something. Uh, can the right, person give more? Uh, yeah. Let's see if Diana has an answer for that. Uh, Diana, if you can hear the prof, uh, would you be able to expand on your question a little bit? Okay, maybe we'll come back to that later. We'll see if there's uh, an expansion of the question. We'll go to the next question. And this one is from uh, William Lau. And the question is, this post-Shannon comms theory seems to include knowledge of the application layer into the objective function of the comms. Today, with this new theory, the application layer will raise the QoS needed and this will then change the comms protocols to deliver the service. How will this new goal-oriented theory bring value to this conventional way of doing it? It's a very, very yes. uh, interesting question. That, that, that's a very good question because that's also one of the challenges as well. How do I know the application goals and what is the right information to send uh, when I have to optimize this? So uh, certain things it has by uh, applying this sampling, for example, is by going to the application queues and uh, apply my, 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 my uh, let's say, filtering and censoring then already when I generate traffic. But certain of these things are transparent to the other, let's say, layers of the protocol, like uh, layer three and four, for example. Most of these things are transparent. So I don't have to, let's say, uh, circulate all this information from all the way from the application layer down to the physical layer. And also, uh, a companion question that is like, they have been also in the networking approaches uh, similar to in spirit, like uh, inter-based networking, I try to define my business goal, my business intent, and then I take this to account of optimize in a machine learning way. So in a way, here is going one step further and 
um, throw these elements, throw these guidelines all the way down to the lower layers of communication, like physical layer, media, Mac layer. So that's the thing. Now, how I, I send the right information without having to pass the optimization from all the layers and even cut some of these layers or being transparent to this layer is key. Otherwise, of course, I will lose this, the scalability. So there's a lot of uh, thinking here. and There's a lot of factoring in the metadata that we'll need to process for that. So that's a very good question. And this is uh, the next challenge, I will say, after the theoretical one is how in practice uh, you will have to do the signaling thing without killing yourself, basically. Thank you so much, Professor. Let's take a look and see if there's uh, any final questions or any expansion of uh, the last question coming in. I believe there might be another question coming right up. And uh, this was the previous question on uh, semantics that uh, is going to be uh, slightly expanded. Hopefully, this will be a little bit clearer. And here's the question coming on screen right now. Okay, so the question was from uh, Deanna R. How do you structure the project based on semantic communication to apply semantic communication for the IoT-based agriculture application? Okay, that's, uh, thank you for the clarification. So. What's going to happen is that, okay, for whatever application you have, for example, agriculture, uh, probably there may be some of the uh, constraints will not be real time, but could be uh, taking into account the environmental, certain changes in the environment and so on. So for me, it will be, for me, this communication theory, so it will be nodes with their own kind of capabilities. So if it's agriculture, maybe they are not mobile all the time, unless there's a robot moving here and there. They will have their own constraints. They will have their own uh, uh, science. And then what I will have to achieve, let's say that the goal is to, um, a simple thing, I will water my uh, my plants or my, uh, or my trees when I detect that the temperature has been like that, the humidity has been like this and so on. Very simple problem, no real time, of course, but maybe I will have to do it from an energy perspective. So I will not have, I will have to, detect the the humidity in the resolution that I will need to allow me to do that, uh, I will have to uh, communicate uh, among nodes to exchange information. For example, if the humidity is different when I'm very far from, my, uh, from the field or in the center of the field and so on. And jointly, they will have to exchange few packets, the right ones, which I have, of course, to define which are the key information attributes that I need here, so that at the end, in a very uh, efficient way, in terms of resources, energy, and so on, these packets arrive to the to the decision we should, uh, you know, uh, water now for this amount of time, and so on. Could be also learning here. It's a learning process based on what I did yesterday, on the day before, what have been the past, you know, past uh, data as well that can be integrated. Now, how exactly to do it so that it doesn't get complicated? This is the challenge of the uh, of this project, actually. And there's a lot of work to do. It's just it's just starting. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Conturis, for answering all those questions from our audience. That was truly a very very eye opening session indeed. And of course, a thank you for the keynote as well on rethinking communication theory for wireless network systems. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the nice questions as well.